As we begin the New Testament, um, I can't begin to explain how happy I am that we have the Old Testament study to sort of um, prepare us. Uh, you know, uh, it's so important to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, both how important they are. And, um, you know, it's, it's tricky for me to hear people say things like, oh, I kind of like the God of the New Testament more than the God of the Old Testament. And um, I've heard that from people. And, and uh, I wonder if God's mad. I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I'm mad, but maybe, you know, like, you know, sometimes you're like, come on, Lord, strike them dead. Cause you're the same, like, you know, it's like <laughs> the same God. The Old Testament and the New, and I know that, but they don't know that, and, and it's hard sometimes. But, but yeah, the blessing of going through the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, with it still fresh in our minds, um, what's so great uh, is the Old Testament, there's so much left undone and unexplained uh, when we left off in Malachi. The, the Old Testament, if that's all you had, and, and if that's all you knew, what do you do with the Old Testament if you don't have the New? You see, our Jewish friends, uh, that's one of the struggles of the Jew. Um, and it's interesting to talk to my Jewish friends about their Hebrew Bible because there's so much that they're wondering about and waiting for. And, and honestly, it's not hard to ask confusing questions because they are still looking for a Messiah that will come. And they don't see Jesus in the New Testament. They don't believe Paul the Apostle. They don't believe the New Testament is from God. And, um, and, and yet the, the New Testament uh, shows us uh, the beautiful uh, continuation of the story. It's almost like watching a, you know, a, a TV series, but only you know, watching half of it and not seeing the end. Or if you're only into the New Testament, not watching the first part and then missing out on the whole back, back part of the story. Um, but only at epic levels. The Bible is so much more, and it's more involved by any, than any series or movie or anything. It's quite amazing. Um, but there's so many things left undone in the Old Testament. In fact, let me just kind of go over a few things that you know, we might think about as we're diving into this. Um, the things left undone, number one, and by the way, the things that are left undone, when I say that, um, if, if, if that's all you have, if, if all you have is the Old Testament, why would, why would we need any more than the Old Testament? Well, um, one of the things that a Jewish mind might think about is why did we do certain ceremonies? One of the fun things to do is to, um, I like talking about um, the Jewish Seder or the Passover dinner with my Jewish friends because the Passover supper, and, and I'm not gonna go into it all tonight, but there's so many pieces of the Passover supper that point to Jesus Christ. And it's, it's amazing. We Gentiles who know the, the story of Jesus, and then we look at the Jewish Passover supper. And Paul the apostle, he said it. He said, Jesus is our Passover. Uh, Jesus is the embodiment of the Passover. But to the Jew, the Passover is just some old story that has to do with Egypt and you know the spirit of death coming over all people, uh, unless they had blood on a door, uh, whatever. But do you understand how many questions are left with that story? See, you and I see it all. We, we see, oh man, there was a lamb that would be slain in the home of every house. And the blood of that lamb, they had to put it on the doorpost and they put it on the right side, the left side, the upper part, and down in the sap, the basin below. And, and in so doing, we, we marvel because if you look at that, that forms the shape of a cross in blood on their door. And, and then the lamb that was slain was slain in his first year, prime of life, without spot or blemish, just like Jesus, without spot or blemish. Um, it was served with bitter herbs. There was a bitterness, but a sweetness. Um, like there's so much of the correlation of the Passover supper. And even in modern, more tr uh, traditional Jewish uh, practices, there's all kinds of things left on the table and seats that are open. And it's all picturing uh, Jesus, the Messiah. And yet to the Jew, the Passover still is largely unexplained. Why do we do this and why is it such a big deal? And what does the spirit of death have to do with anything? Well, we all are cursed with death because of sin. And, and if, you have, if you have the blood of Jesus, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And Jesus is the blood that was shed. Like the whole picture is so amazing. So, and I'm just talking about the Passover. We could talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Pentecost. There's so much where the New Testament brings all of those Old Testament uh, ceremonies uh, to, to fruition and, and they all start to make full sense. Um, that's why we love, I, I, you know, my Jewish friends in, in Jerusalem particularly, I was like, why do you Christians care? Um, it's, 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 a, it's a real head scratcher for them because did you know the Jews are not evangelistic? 
Like, the, you know, we, we forget that, but the Jews are not going around, you know, saying, become a Jew, be like us. You know, they're not having Jew, Jewish crusades, hoping more people will become Jews. Um, meanwhile, we Christians are all excited about Judaism, not because we love Judaism as much, but we love the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so that's why we love Judaism, because it all points to Jesus Christ. And that's why we love the Old Testament. So the Jews are like, why do you love the Old Testament so much? It's our Bible. It's the Hebrew Bible. We're not even really inviting you to like it, but you love it. <laughs> and you love us. And they really do. They, they marvel at why the Gentile church um, uh, wonders about that, especially Amer the American church, because there's still enough Christians that are not replacement theology where they've, you know, there's so much of the church that says the Jews are done. God doesn't like the Jews anymore. And he chose the church instead, which is a false teaching, by the way. Um, but um, the Jews marvel at that. So that's one of the things the New Testament starts to uh, clarify is the unexplained uh, parts of the ceremonies. Number two, um, unachieved purposes. Um, the promises and the covenants of the Old Testament, some of them were fulfilled in short form in the Old Testament, but most of the big promises given to the Jewish people in the Old Testament are still uh, unachieved. They, they haven't been uh, brought to fruition until you read the New Testament and study Jesus the Messiah. So that's an important part. Also, number three, um, you know, um, unappeased longings. Uh, the, the desire of the Jewish heart, oh Lord, like, like I think of so many of the Psalms, you know, oh, I lift up my, my you know, uh, my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Um, have the Jews been able to see a lot of help in their day? Well, there's some. We, we look at their history and we see God intervening. But the Jews have been under great persecution and there's still anti-Semitism all over the world. And the Bible, the promises and the, the longing of the Jew is to be at peace and have peace in the world. But we, we know, you and I as New Testament believers, uh, as, as the Old Testament continues in the story through the New, we know that the Prince of Peace is Jesus. And when Jesus comes, his second coming, he'll rule and reign from Jerusalem. And that's the ultimate longing of the Jew is to have uh, the Messiah who, who will be there uh, and, and, and dealing with that, you know, the problems of the Jews. Um, and then there's another big one. Uh, and that is number four, <clears throat> unfulfilled prophecies. Uh, the New Testament uh, will uh, show how many prophecies will be fulfilled in fact, but also they might be, um, uh, you know, even foretold how they're going to be fulfilled in future times even still. So the, the, the New Testament brings clarity that's left undone and it's unclear if you just had the Old Testament. So that's important. Now, because of this, some churches and some pastors um, will say, well, we don't really need the Old Testament anymore. It's an old book, the Old Testament. We like the new, everybody likes the new, nobody likes the old. Like there's this mentality, a popular mega church pastor uh, just a few years ago made the claim recently that we should unhitch uh, Christianity from the Old Testament because the Old Testament presents so many imp impediments to the belief or, of, of, uh, of the contemporary people. Uh, and that's what he said. Uh, and he should be, um, you know, what do you say? Defrocked or whatever, uh, <laughs> unpulpited in my opinion. When a guy says, you know, dump the Old Testament, he's in big trouble. Um, I'm told that he's trying to walk that back a little bit, which I'm really glad to hear. I hope he does because the Old Testament is important. The two, the Old Testament and the New Testament are, are um, linked together perfectly. They go together and you can't really do one without the other. Um, without the old, we cannot understand the new. Um, without the new, we have an incomplete understanding of the old. Um, the old covenant is uh, like a gripping, powerful, epic movie, eternally set on pause with, 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 without the New Testament. It's just eternally set on pause. But the, the climax and the culmination of the movie is the New Testament, where Jesus the Messiah appears. Um, you know, there's an old saying, the old is in the new revealed, the new is in the old concealed. And that's an interesting way of putting it because, you know, um, when you read, you can get all the doctrines of the New Testament in the Old Testament, but it's, it's a little bit cryptic if you just look backwards. You know, when you think about where Paul the apostle and Peter and, and the d disciples and even some of Jesus' teaching, like where did they get their stuff? 
about the resurrection and stuff like that. They got it from the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. You can, you can see all those things um, in the Old Testament. It's just a little more cryptic in the old. It's spoken clearly in the new. So the old saying, the old is in the new revealed, the new is in the old concealed, and that's true. Um, as we looked into the New Testament while we we're in the Old Testament, we will also look back into the Old Testament as we're in the New Testament. Some of you, if you've only been here for only nine years, we haven't been in the New, we haven't been in the New Testament. This is new for you unless you're you know, uh, nine years old or older. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been in the New Testament. But, but if you've been here, you'll notice we've covered a lot of ground in the New Testament while we were going through the Old, if you kind of notice. Um, why do we do that? Uh, because they both intermesh so perfectly. So one of the fun things about the, and we'll do this tonight. When you look at the New Testament, you gotta refer back to the old because it just makes everything pop and come alive. And uh, this, is where, this is where so many people, I think they miss it. They don't see how the Bible is multi-layered, multi-faceted. They don't see this amazing, miraculous level of the book that we hold. And my hope is tonight we'll even begin showing you more and more of that. But the Gospel of Matthew, as we begin the New Testament, is the perfect bridge between the Old Testament and the New. Uh, let me go over a few notes about the actual Gospel of Math Matthew. Number one, um, um, the bridge that it sets is kind of for, for like, uh, you know, bringing the Old Testament people and believers and Jews, it was meant to be spoken in a way that would sort of bridge the gap between the old. In fact, um, of all the gospels, Matthew, remember gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the four gospels. Of all the gospels, um, Matthew quotes the Old Testament 129 times. Uh, that, that's a lot, he, 120, more than any other gospel. Um, the, the idea of the kingdom of heaven is talked about 32 times in the gospel of Matthew. And, and nine times uh, the gospel of Matthew uses this phrase, that it might be fulfilled. Uh, what's that? That's when Matthew says, this is the fulfillment of that Old Testament uh, prophecy. Nine times Matthew says, this is that fulfillment. So those are big moments. When you come to that uh, moment in the gospel of Matthew where it says, this is fulfilled, then you'll know, oh, there's a big moment. There, there's a fulfilling of the Old Testament prophecy. Um, and then also uh, he uses the phrase, that which is spoken over and over 14 times, that which was spoken. That's referring back, uh, not, not necessarily a direct quote, but uh, what it was generally speaking of, he'll, he'll talk about that a lot. So it was a bridge. Matthew is a bridge uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Number two, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew was written primarily to the Jewish audience. It was for Jews, which is interesting. Um, uh, you know, and, and the goal of Matthew in, in some ways you might say is to confirm whether the Jews are ready to receive this or not, largely not. Um, does anybody know why the Jews don't receive the gospel of Jesus Christ? I, I'm hearing you all say it, that's good. The Bible says blindness in part has happened to Israel. They're, the Lord is purposefully blinded. Well, that's not very nice. No, remember the Jews were in rebellion and they were worshiping idols and pagan deities and there's all kinds of rebellion on the Jewish side back in the Old Testament. But in, in, uh, until that time, when the fullness of the Gentile church comes in, then he's gonna open their eyes and he's got a plan to uh, re remove that veil or that blinding that they have right now. So when I say the Jews don't get it, it's not that I'm being condescending. Um, the, the Jews are smarter than us. I think that's pretty clear if you just look at history. Um, they're very smart people, but they are smart people that have been given a layer of blindness and they don't see the Messiah. And you know, if you've ever tried to talk with Jewish people, it's, it, you'll see this. I've talked to Jews in Jerusalem and showed them in their Hebrew Bible, look, this is Jesus right here. And I'll show them prophecies from Isaiah and the Psalms. And there's so many amazing prophecies from the Hebrew Bible. And they, they're, they're almost like really intrigued. Like, wow, we've never seen that before. And, and you're almost thinking, I've got them right where I want them. You know, they're gonna accept Jesus, Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jew right here, you know. But then, and then I say, do you wanna accept Jesus as your savior? And they're like, what are you talking about? And they walk away. And I, I see that. It's, it's, like a, it's, it's like a blindness that has happened. So, so uh, all that to say, Matthew was written in, in a way for the Jews to understand. And I wonder if the gospel of Matthew will be used heavily um, when it comes time after the rapture of the church, when the Jews will see that Jesus was the Messiah. If, if I were a betting man, I would say the Jews are gonna grab the gospel of Matthew during the tribulation and say, wow, we missed all this. And Matthew might just be the commentary 
written for the Jews for that time. Uh, and I'll show you that the Jewishness of Matthew as we uh, get, get through it. Um, it also presents Jesus in this context of written for the Jews as king of the Jews. That's an important part of the gospel of Matthew, written as king of the Jews. Um, um, another little point you might wanna note is Matthew was a tax collector. Um, his name was previously Levi, uh, uh, interestingly enough. He was employed by the Romans. Do you think that made him a popular Jew? No, if you were working for the Romans, you were kind of in bad standing in, in society. But he was a tax collector. Uh, and of course, tax collectors were hated because if you worked for the Romans, they hated you for that. But they also, the tax collector kind of, they, they could do whatever they wanted. Under Roman rule, these guys would often sort of charge for the Roman tax, but then they'd add a whatever arbitrary number uh, to pay for their services. Uh, I'm a tax lawyer, so you, you owe the Romans this much, but you owe this much because, and they put a bunch in their pocket and they were pretty much ripping off the Jewish people, sad to say. Um, so that's another thing about Matthew. Um, also, he had autism uh, spectrum disorder. I just wanted to say that just to see what you guys would do. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, address the chosen. Uh, some of you have watched, how many of you guys have watched the Chosen series? Oh wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I, I knew that. Uh, I knew that that would be a lot. And you know, um, they, they de depicted uh, Matthew as having autistic spectrum disorder, uh, um, uh, Asperger's. And, um, and uh, let, let me just say, I understand what they were doing and it's so wonderful, you know, be in the sense of, um, you, know, uh, you know, the Lord can use anyone and any, you know, even, even those of us that have disorders and I'm sure I have many, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's great to know that the Lord can use the weak and the foolish. And, but that's, if you ask the creators of The Chosen why they gave him Asperger's, it's because uh, they thought it'd be wonderful to make people feel included and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. So when I say he had Asperger's, I, I'm totally lying to you right now. And, um, but the reason I, I, I'm actually using this as an excuse, as we go through the gospel, um, I, I want you to be careful. And, and um, people just ask me, you know, Brett, what do you think of the chosen? What do you think of the chosen? And, and it's funny, it depends on who you talk to. Brett, it's an LDS publication. Uh, well, it's actually not. And the guy said some stuff about LDS and Latter-day Saints and Mormons, Mormons and stuff that was uh, maybe misunderstood or misconstrued, maybe. But, um, but all that to say, there's all kinds of controversy about you know, that. And, and here's the thing. They took some liberties, uh, creative liberties, to kind of tell a story that is, uh, and I'll just put it this way, uh, it's, there's a lot of biblical uh, parts to the story. And it's a story that kind of matches somewhat uh, to the Bible. And, and, it's, and, and, and I'll just say, uh, there's some parts that I pr think are particularly moving. Uh, like I, I really liked uh, how they depicted some of the stories. Um, like the woman at the well story. I thought, wow, that's awesome. Like I, it, it was just moving to watch that the way they depicted it. I also like kind of the way they portrayed Jesus. He's not the, you, you know, you always hear me talk about the, the wasted Jesus that's like uh, been smoking weed. Uh, and, he, and all the movies, particularly like he's some beady eyed guy that just needs a hamburger. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, and he sort of floats when he walks. And, and if somebody says something, he goes. <laughs> like they make him this weird dude. I, I like that the chosen didn't make Jesus a weirdo. That, that's kind of cool. Uh, I like that. But let me just say this. Do not use the chosen to set your doctrine on who Jesus is and all that stuff. Like, like it's okay if you're using it as like, oh, that's interesting the way they depicted that part of the, but it's, it's really people taking all kinds of license to add stuff to the story that may or may not be in the Bible. Uh, now, we could argue whether people should do that or not. Uh, maybe you were blessed by it. Uh, maybe you weren't. Maybe you're like Mormons uh, or whatever. Uh, I don't know. But I would just always say with anything coming uh, from anybody other than the Bible, you have to be really, really careful. You know, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson, was amazing. It showed the torturous crucifixion like no other movie's ever shown. And it was probably amazingly realistic. Uh, and the way they predict, pro projected that onto the screen, uh, Passion of the Christ. Um, but the problem is there's all kinds of Catholic things in there too that they added. Like when Jesus was on the Via Della Rosa, he put his face in the cloth and his face imprint was on the cloth. The Catholics have that cloth. 
they say. And it's just a relic that's not even real. Um, and uh, stuff like that. And Mary is definitely the mother of God in the compassion of the Christ uh, in kind of a Catholic way, uh, if you know what I'm saying. So no matter what you're watching on TV or whatever, be really, really careful. What we're about to do by going through the Gospel of Matthew, we're gonna get the real deal right here. You don't have to doubt anything we read or see in this Gospel of Matthew. Uh, so I'm just taking a, a liberty right now to say that. Um, so Matthew, uh, his house, because he was probably wealthy, his house was a place where uh, publicans and sinners hung out. Uh, what, what's a publican? Well, it's not a Democrat, um, <laughs> but it's not a Republican either. The publicans were uh, people like Matthew, people that were sort of sinful and, and that they were, um, you know, like ripoffs and, and doing things wrong. And so uh, we're gonna see Matthew's house is a place where publicans and sinners hang out. And the religious leaders say, I can't believe Jesus is hanging out with people like that. And we'll talk about that as Jesus being the friend of sinners. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna see that, that that's a good thing to hang out with sinners, as long as you're not being one of the sinners. And we'll see that in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, uh, I'm so glad that we get to be in the world, but not of the world, you know, and that's something we have to uh, do uh, as Christians. And Jesus is gonna demonstrate that, even though he's gonna hang out with publicans and sinners. Um, so um, uh, all that to say, Jesus is gonna be in the Gospel of Matthew, one who shines brightly even in the midst of sinners, and that's important. Uh, I remember uh, we got booted out of the school for a whole, uh, I think it was a whole summer, uh, when we were doing our Wednesday night Bible studies at the Athey Creek Middle School across the freeway. And we were just looking for places to do our Bible study. And we finally got the Holiday Inn in Wilsonville to let us uh, use their building. And uh, it was great, uh, but it was always funny to me, the contrast, because uh, we'd, I'd walk in the door, and, and forgive me if you hung out at this place, but I, there, was a, there was this hallway that I walked in, and you could walk in, and then you'd walk by the Holiday Inn bar. There's a bar there, kind of a smoky bar. And, and I thought, man, who would hang out at the Holiday Inn bar? You know, it's like, and I, I remember walking by the door and you could see in and it was smoky. And, and there was this like middle-aged lady singing kind of off key feelings, you know, karaoke or whatever. And there was a couple guys with their beers shooting pool. And, and I was just like, oh man, I just, I just got a little snapshot of, and I, I don't know how else to say it, but I was kind of embarrassed for all of them. Like, hey, there's a Bible study down the hall, man. Get, get, come on out of there, get out of there. That smoke and uh, that lady singing and we'll sing some songs of the Lord together over down the hall here in the hall. But we, we did that. It was, it was a, a kind of a compare and contrast. But, but at the same time, I sort of loved that we had our Wednesday night Bible study right next to the room where uh, there was the, you know, the smoky bar where people were probably being unfaithful to their spouse and stuff like that. It was, a, it, was a chance to, uh, it was a chance to sort of be in, in the world, but not of the world. And, and I saw that. And, and that's something you and I are all called to be. We're called to be separate from this world, but we're also called to be salt and light in the world. And that's what Jesus is gonna demonstrate in the Gospel of Matthew, um, how to be uh, you know, sent by the Father and yet without the compromise of the world. You know, I, I'm reminded of Romans chapter 12, verse two. You know, and be not conform to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, man, to not be conformed to this world. Christians are like manure. <laughs> Piled up in a pile, they start to smell real bad. But you spread them out, uh, they start to do a lot of good, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's an old farmer's uh, quote, I think. Um, <laughs> like fertilizer, you know, they do a lot of good. Um, but that's one of the things we have to do is I love how Jesus was able to hang out with the publicans and the sinners. And that's true, by the way, of not only uh, the idea of manure, but like even you are the salt of the world. Remember when Jesus said that in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you're the salt of the world. Um, by the way, do you like salt on food? Generally, yes. Do you like a huge pile of salt on your food? No, that's too much. And Christians are like that. And then he goes on and says, not only you're the light, uh, salt of the world, but you're also the light of the world, it says here. Um, you know, you are the light of the world, verse 14, a city set on a hill. Is, uh, is light generally a good thing? Is too much light fun? Yeah, have you ever been blinded by super bright light? You're like, ah, that, see Christians, that's, that's, we're gonna see Jesus be the light in the world. 
And yet he's not gonna blind everybody. Um, and Jesus is the one who's gonna not be conformed to this world. He's not gonna compromise what is right and what is wrong, but he's still gonna be in the world. And we're gonna see how, you know, Matthew records the, the ministry of Jesus. Um, and Matthew's gonna have to learn this himself, by the way, to, to learn how to be the hammer instead of the nail, uh, like we talked about uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, one final note about Matthew before we start reading. Um, uh, it was written about 50 years after the story actually happened, his time with Jesus. So Matthew would be an old, older man by that time. Um, one thing you gotta remember is the, the disciples were mostly young men. Some were probably teenagers still when Jesus called them. Uh, Peter was probably the oldest of them, but the other guys were uh, very young. So uh, Matthew you know, wrote this when he was nearing, like, or close to 70 years old when he penned uh, this gospel. Um, and that's kind of interesting. But, um, but like I said earlier about this, um, you know, uh, he's gonna present Jesus as the, as the king of the Jews and he's gonna start that presentation right here in chapter one, verse one, beginning uh, with the genealogy of Jesus through the line of Joseph. Um, and he'll be presented to be king, uh, which you kind of need to prove his pedigree as king. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter one, verse one. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Perez and Zara, and Tamar, uh, of Tamar. And Perez begat Ezron, and Ezron begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, or Rahab, uh, and um, Boaz, uh, Boaz, uh, or Boaz of Obed begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been of the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Roboam, and Roboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat jo uh, Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Ahaz, and Ahaz begat uh, Ezekias, uh, and Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Amon, and Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Shalathiel, and Shalathiel begat Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Atzor, and Atzor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar, Eleazar begat um, Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So uh, you say, Brett, we're off to a really bad start here, Ben. <laughs> um, I'm having second thoughts about this, going through the Bible with you. Uh, yikes, uh, the genealogies of the Bible. Um, you know, the one thing I've learned over the years of, as, as, as kind of studying the Bible, the genealogies when I was a kid, that was the boring part. But as an older guy, this is the exciting part right here. The genealogies in the Bible are in fact exciting and have all kinds of stuff. And it, you just have to kind of know where to look and, and do a little bit of work uh, to see what that is. But they're packed full of information and really good things that we can learn. And it takes it kind of to another level, a deeper level of Bible and meaning and importance. Um, and so let's, let's break this genealogy down a little bit here. Uh, and we'll start with verse one. Verse one is the verse that really sums it up. Um, what Matthew is trying to do. Remember, the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as Messiah of the Jews um, or King of the Jews. And by the way, the word Messiah in Hebrew is king. Um, the Jews would say Messiah Saul, 
or, or Messiah, you know, uh, you know, Hezekiah or Messiah Josiah. They were, that's the word for king. But the Jews also recognized there was the Messiah coming. So Messiah just generally means king, but they were looking for the Messiah. And that's what Matthew's gonna do is present Jesus as the Messiah, the king of the Jews. Um, and so um, what's interesting is, um, you know, with, with Abraham, uh, you know, in, in verse, uh, verse two, it, it links G Jesus racially. But when you look at David there uh, in verse one, see verse one says he was uh, the son of David, son of Abraham. There's a jump there from Abraham to David and we skipped a bunch of people. But the reason Abraham's included is to make sure everybody knows Jesus was a Jew. As it turns out, he wasn't a surfer from Southern California. I know a lot of you have the picture of Jesus with the long blonde hair knocking at the door and you're like, yeah, he's a surfer. Whoa, bro, that's awesome. But that's, that's not Jesus. He was a Jew. Don't forget that. Uh, especially these anti-Semitic people in churches that go around bashing Jews and stuff. Don't forget, Jesus was a Jew. Uh, we owe the Jews a lot of thanks because they gave to the world the Messiah. That's why in Genesis, Abraham was promised all the nations of the world will be blessed by your seed, Abraham. And why? because Jesus was of the seed of Abraham. That's mentioned here in verse one. So Abraham and David mentioned in verse one, reminds us, uh, Abraham, he was uh, racially a Jew, but David regally, he was uh, uh, of, the, of the root of David, son of David, of the lineage of David, which is an important thing. Um, why is it important that Jesus be linked to David? Anybody? Is it bloodline? Or what, what is the, what's the main concept of David? David was the king. And the, the, the idea of Jesus being the king, he has to be sort of related, doesn't he? To be a king. And, and we're gonna tie that together and show you some stuff about that that's kind of important. But one of the things, like, uh, remember when blind Bart, blind Bartimaeus, uh, called out in Ma uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 47, it says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Um, this guy, by saying thou son of David, what was blind Bartimaeus actually saying there? He was recognizing Jesus as rightful heir to the throne by calling him a son of David which is kind of a big deal in the story of the blind man that was healed by Jesus. By him saying, thou son of David, um, he was recognizing Jesus was the king of the Jews. Um, now, not only was it, a, you know, um, that David was a king, but do you remember that David was given a Davidic covenant? Now, that's something we talked about. Even we talked about it a few months ago. I, I forget why, but we brought up the Davidic covenant. There's all kinds of covenants in the Old Testament. The Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, but the Davidic covenant, as they call it, it's a, a covenant made to David. In fact, um, why don't you grab your uh, Old Testament, keep your finger here in Matthew, go with me to 2 Samuel chapter seven. Because this is important to understand the messiahship of Jesus and his link to David uh, that's, that's so important. Um, the, the Davidic covenant came uh, from a promise from Samuel the prophet. Uh, and it starts here in 2 Samuel chapter seven. Let's begin there uh, in verse one. Second Samuel seven, one. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, that's David, and the Lord had given him rest round from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells with curtains or in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that's in thy heart for the Lord is with thee. Um, by the way, pause for a second. Be careful when you tell people that. Um, have you ever had something, I'm thinking about doing this and I've been praying about this. And you're like, go and do it, man. You should go do it. Be careful if you're one of those people. That's the Nathan. Nathan the prophet's like, David's like, man, all my enemies are killed. I've got nothing to do. But the Ark of the Covenant is still over at, in the tent you know, of the tabernacle and, and there's, no, there's no real temple. I need to build a house for the Lord. And they said, knock yourself out, man. That's awesome. Great idea. Go for it. Um, be careful when you tell people that because sometimes I've learned as a pastor who's done a lot of counseling and spent time telling people, uh, I'm learning to just kind of not, not just open my big mouth, but sometimes say, what is the Lord showing you to do? 
because that's what the Lord sometimes really needs to. It's not people that should give you. But Nathan's like, knock yourself out. But verse four, it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, that's the prophet saying, go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought the children up out of Israel, out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And he goes on and says, you can't build it. Uh, you're, you're, you're a man of war, a man with blood on your hands. You're not the one who's gonna build my temple. So, so Nathan asked the, you know, the next day, eat humble pie and go, David, uh, I spoke too soon, sorry, bro, but uh, you can't build the temple. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, what, what happens after that? Well, this kind of cracks me up. This is one of the funny things in the Bible. Um, so David's already living in peace. All the nations around him are quivering in their sandals because David's so powerful. His army's so powerful. Um, but so he thinks, okay, I'm done with war, so I want to build. And they says, you can't build. So what did David go do after that? Well, um, um, there's a couple things. First of all, the Lord um, gives him a promise. Check out, let's, let's fast forward to verse 11. Um, in verse 11 of 2 Samuel 7, uh, uh, the Lord speaks through Nathan and says, as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Huh? What? Nathan says, David, you're not gonna build me a house because you have blood on your hands, but I'm gonna make for you a house. Yeah, but, but it just said he had a palace and he built his house of cedar wood. Everything was all dialed. David already got a house, but that's not what the Lord was saying. Verse 12 goes on. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt uh, sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. Um, <laughs> uh, interesting, establish whose kingdom? Well, that would be the Messiah. He's talking about through the line of David would come a house or, or a lineage of kings that would be an everlasting throne. A king, verse 13, build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's the Davidic covenant, really, that, that the Lord says through your line, David, you're gonna, you're gonna be the, uh, the one who's the ancestry through your line to bring the Messiah. Um, pretty cool stuff. Now, um, can I just say this for a second? David gets a hearty no from God. I wanna build a, t a temple in Jerusalem. The Lord says no. But can I just say, when the Lord gives you a no, be careful, don't mope, don't be bummed, don't pout. Because the Lord, he, the way he works is he's always got something better for you. Um, what if your boyfriend dumped you uh, and you're feeling like, oh, what a bummer. If the Lord says no to that, maybe the Lord's doing you a huge favor. You have no idea. Maybe the guy's a total jerk and he's just been a play actor for the last you know, six months, so you've been dating. And the Lord's like, no, like, but I love him. No. <laughs> Take the no from God as a good thing because David had to do that. I wanna build a temple and the Lord says, no. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'm gonna build for you a house and I'm gonna make you a, a, a kingdom that's gonna be an everlasting kingdom through your bloodline. Like, like um, it's gonna be better than anything you imagine. So just, just chill out. So then what did David do? After he hears this great covenant from God that through his line, um, let's look at chapter eight real quick. Uh, um, and I'm gonna go through this really fast. But in chapter eight, what does David go do with his time now? Um, look at verse one. After this, it came to pass that David smote. Look at verse, um, the second part of verse one. David took. Look at verse two. And he smote Moab. Verse three, he smote Hadarezer. Uh, verse four, he took, uh, verse five, five, the second part of verse five, David slew the Syrians. Verse seven, he took the shields. Verse eight, he took exceeding brass. He, verse 10, the second verse, he fought against Hadarezer and smitten him. And we could go on and on. What did David do? He did what he was good at. He was good at killing people. He wasn't a temple builder. He was just somebody who just knew, he was like a Navy SEAL Team 6 guy. He just knew, he was good at warfare. And so uh, I love what David does. Instead of complaining about what he couldn't do, he just did what he could. And, and, and when you read the whole story, he goes out there and, and smites all these enemies. And you think, well, that's so mean. Well, you gotta understand, these are all pagans who are living horrible, sinful existences, all these people groups. And they were the people that God told them to, to slay anyway. Uh, years earlier. 
So David's just kind of going around mopping up and he's collecting all the stuff that they need so that his son would then be, be able to build. Can you imagine Solomon gets to the job and he's already got all the rebar and the gold and the silver and the brass and all the stuff you need, the cedars of Lebanon. It was all lie, lying there because David uh, did all the collecting uh, and on and on he went. Couldn't build the house. What, what did he do? He went to what he was good at doing. And so get David gathered the necessary materials. Don't complain about what you can't do, but do what you can. That, that's what we learned through David. But through David's line would come the Messiah. Great plan for David. Um, really, really cool. Now, um, one thing I might say is, um, you know, do what you're good at. That, that's something all throughout the Bible. You know, uh, remember Moses uh, was uh, there and the Lord said, I want you to lead the children of Israel. And he's like, but I can't speak and I'm not, I can't do it. And the Lord says, Moses, what is in your hand? And he says, well, a, a staff. He had a shepherd's staff. And, and, he, and he took that staff and he gave that, and he said, Moses, I want you to, to just use this staff um, to be my leader over the people of Israel. And the Lord used that staff. Whatever's in your hand is kind of the thing you wanna do. And that's, that's what David, he had a sword in his hand. He's really good at it. And the question is, what is in your hand? What's in your wallet? No, no, what's in, what's in your hand that the Lord can use? And, and oftentimes what's in your hand is the very thing that the Lord wants to use. I've seen people do stuff that they wish they were good at, um, but they're not. And it's because they wanna do what other people are doing, like David wanting to build the temple, but that wasn't his thing. It's like me wanting to play basketball. I grew up, my next door neighbor, uh, Kirk Daly, uh, you know, and he was four years older than me, but man, he'd be out there shooting hoops and I'd run over and I'd say, can I play? And he's like, yeah, okay. And we'd play, you know, uh, since, since the time I was like five years old. And, but I could never figure out why he could always make it into the basket every time. And he just was so good. I just couldn't figure it out. Well, he was six foot 10. Uh, and and he, was a, he, he ended up being a professional basketball player. And, and, um, and I could never figure out why. One time we were at Bend, uh, Sun River, and we, we went and played a, a, a two on three. Me and Kirk, non-basketball, Mr. Basketball, against these three other guys. And um, we beat them, and he didn't make one shot. I made all the shots, and here's why. He'd do all the fancy stuff, and all the three guys were just trying to figure out how to get, uh, keep him from making baskets. Um, and then I'd be standing there over by myself. <laughs> And Kirk would just kind of, you know, throw it over to me and I'd, I'd be, you know, ooh, I'd miss half of them. But even with that, uh, he'd get the ball to me. And, I, and I, I came home and told the ladies, yeah, we won. Kirk didn't make any baskets. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord did not put a basketball in my hand. You know, Kirk, Kirk he used the basketball because he uh, played pro basketball and went to Germany, played basketball, but he also played for Athletes in Action. If you guys know what that is, that's a legit, uh, you know, ba back in the days of AC Green, uh, uh, Kirk, I think, played with those guys. Um, but he, he was good and he had a basketball in the end and he, and he used it for the Lord, to serve the Lord. And I love when people just do what they're good at in a way to serve the Lord. All, the, all that, I'm off course, that's David. He, he uses the sword to do what he's good at. But that's the Davidic covenant. There's gonna be a kingdom through uh, David. Now, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, the next thing I want you to see is something that would have shocked a lot of the Jews who would read Matthew chapter one, verses one through 16. Um, they would have been shocked that there were four women referred to in this genealogy. Um, you know, that was a no-no. Uh, I know that seems weird to us, like why don't they mention women? But, um, you know, uh, it was the United States, we didn't let women vote until recently. Like, like we were behind the time. Like, like, you know, the treatment of women throughout history has always been kind of crazy. Um, but in those days, you didn't bring the women into the uh, genealogy. But what, what also you wouldn't do is bring the kind of women that are brought into this genealogy. Let's look at these women just, 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 just for the fun of it here in Matthew chapter one. Um, the four women, we start in verse three. It says in verse three, and Judas begat uh, Phares and Zerah of Tamar, and Phares begat Ezram. Tamar is uh, the woman from a, a kind of a crazy story of Genesis chapter 38. You can jot this down in your notes and maybe read this story. Um, but uh, as it turns out, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, there was a law that if a man married a, a woman and then that man dies, his younger brother was supposed to marry her. 
And um, the reason they would do that, it, it's something we don't deal with today, but they didn't have welfare. They didn't have, you know, uh, ways to help, uh, you know, women out in the wilderness who had no husband. So it was a, it was a way to keep a woman whose husband died uh, provided for. And it was like the mercy of the Lord saying, this is the rule of Deuteronomy 25. And this, remember, this is the law of Moses. So we're no longer under that law. Um, uh, but that was the law of that time for the Jews. And so there was a guy named Ur, E-R, of Genesis 38, who kicked the bucket. His wife was Tamar. Um, and by the way, Ur was really wicked. I think the Lord was the one who kind of offed him. Uh, so Ur kicks the bucket, and then Tamar says, uh, okay, uh, I need a husband. So Onan, uh, not Conan, Onan, uh, the barbarian, uh, he, <laughs> Onan uh, was supposed to marry her and the idea is consummate their marriage and give her a child and, and that, that was the way it was supposed to go. But Onan did some wacko stuff and he spills his seed out on the ground. It's a crazy story of the Old Testament uh, that we could go over and we're not gonna talk about that too much tonight. Uh, but that's what he did and the Lord says, I don't like that. So he kills Onan. God kills Onan. So Tamar is still uh, single and without help and so um, the next guy in line is a guy named Sheila. And uh, Sheila was too young to be her husband, but when he got old enough, he was supposed to theoretically take her to be wife. But the, the father of this whole situation was Judah, member of the tribe of Judah. Well, the father, Judah, kind of said, yeah, whatever, Tamar, good luck with that, and sort of left her off by herself. And even though Sheila was supposed to take, that, that never really was gonna happen. So Sheila was in trouble because they weren't doing what the law told them to do. Does that make sense? So uh, Judah just kind of blows her off. Well, Judah goes down to the time of the sheep shearers to a place called Timnath. Interesting place, the same place Samson got into some trouble with some ladies. If you remember, Timnath was sort of like the Las Vegas, I guess, or whatever of Bible times. So, um, so J Judah heads down to Timnath and suddenly he sees this prostitute seemingly walking down the street and he wants to hire her for services and Judah does. Now this is the Judah, the, the tribe of Israel, father of the tribe of praise. Um, <clears throat> he, he, he's ready to hire a prostitute and she says, well, how are you gonna pay me? And, and, and he says, um, I, I'll give you a goat. Uh, that's how they paid for such things in those times. Um, so she says, well, how do I know you're gonna, I, and I wasn't born yesterday. Uh, how do I know you're gonna pay me a goat? Give me something. Uh, and, and he says, well, what do you want? And she says, uh, that ring on your finger, the bracelet on your wrist, and I want your staff. And, and then I'll keep those as you know, collateral until you pay me the goat, and then I'll give that stuff back. And Judah's like, cool. And so he goes and sleeps with Tamar, and, and she's veiled and all that as a prostitute, so he doesn't even recognize that it's actually his daughter-in-law. That's the story. So anyway, Judah goes home and whatever. Uh, everything's great until he goes to pay the woman the goat. He goes back like the next day with the goat. And he says, uh, where's the prostitute here? And they're like, what prostitute? There's never a prostitute here. Uh, no, there's one, she was here. Oh, never, we never see prostitute here. And see, she dressed up like a prostitute to trick Judah into giving her his ring, his bracelet, and his staff. So she's pregnant with her father-in-law's children. Um, which makes him now totally responsible for her. Um, and, but he doesn't know that yet. He just thinks he slept with a prostitute and I guess I don't have to pay her, but where's my ring and my bracelet and my staff? Well, sometime later, suddenly the servants come in. Hey, Judah, your daughter-in-law, you know, Tamar, she wants to see you. He's like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Uh, oh, I forgot something. Um, when, when, when he heard that she had ripped him off of his ring, she didn't know who the, guy, or the girl was. She said, that woman should be burnt alive. Like he was really hard on her saying, you know, that, that prostitute should be burned alive, whatever. And finally Tamar comes in as the, as, as the daughter-in-law and he says, hey, how, how can I help you, honey? And she hands him his ring, his bracelet, and his staff. That could be a movie, I'm just saying. Like, can you imagine that dramatic moment when Judah's like, oh. And she's pregnant out to here, you know what I mean? With twins, as it turns out. Um, in fact, in Genesis, um, uh, it, it's interesting the way the story uh, goes. You know, um, in fact, I'll just read it from Genesis chapter 38, where it says this. It says, uh, Genesis 38, 25, it says, when she was brought forth, she sent her uh, to her father-in-law saying, by man, 
by the man whose these are, the ring, the, the you know, bracelet, the staff, I am with child. Discern, I pray thee, whose these are, the signet, the bracelet, the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I. Remember he said, burn her to death before. Now he's saying, she is more righteous than I because I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. In other words, he didn't sleep with her anymore after that. I guess not. Um, uh, the mood of love was somewhat out of the uh, question at that point. But you say, Brett, why are you telling us this? Do you understand? Like, why would the genealogy of, of why would you even mention this? If you're a Jew, would you mention Tamar in the story? Because that's the story. Um, and as it turns out, if you look at the verse there, back in Matthew uh, chapter one, in verse three, it says, Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah, Pharaoh and Zerah, those are the two sons of Tamar, the, the twins that were born of Judah. Um, what a horrible story to have in your family story. But see, this is what I wanna tell you about this. This is, this is kind of cool because this just goes to show you that the Bible doesn't pull its punches when it comes to telling the story. You'd think that there'd be these stained glass saints in the genealogy of Jesus, wouldn't you? But I think there's a point here and I'll show you. Well, let's go to the next lady. Since Tamar was kind of acting like a prostitute and kind of an embarrassing story, let's go to the next lady, Rahab. <laughs> now you might be laughing because verse five, Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. Um, and if you know the story of Rahab, there uh, she was the one who was also a prostitute. Um, an amazing woman though, uh, nonetheless. She, she was a woman who saved the spies, remember, and hid them in her house at Jericho. Uh, amazing story, she played the harlot as well, but she also did some amazing stuff. Um, what about Ruth? Ruth is in there, you say, well, Brett, Ruth was a wonderful woman, and she was, I'm not gonna say that, but do you remember who Ruth was? What was she? She was a Moabite. Do you understand? Like, like we get all fuzzy when we talk about Ruth because she was a Moabite, and we should but she was a Gentile of the Moabites. Remember remember the, the history of the Moabite women? Remember uh, when the Moabite women came down and dressed themselves up and married the Jewish guys and uh, Phineas had to come and stick them through with a spear? Like there's a whole history there about the Jews intermarrying with Moabites. Another thing, I mean, Ruth was, we, we think of her fondly because it's an amazing story and it really is a redemptive picture of, of really us and Jesus, the kindred redeemer, near kinsman. It's a great story. But still, as a Jew, do you wanna bring up the Gentile in the genealogy? The woman that's the Gentile? Probably not. But you got Tamar, you got Rahab, Ruth, all Gentiles. So let's find, there's one more woman in praise the Lord. She is a Jew. Oh, whew. her name, Bathsheba. <laughs> oh. She's not named here exactly, but look at verse six. It says, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Okay, so they didn't mention her. <laughs> they didn't say her name, but they did say, well, it was, she, she, was, she was the one part of the line of, of David to, to Jesus, which is interesting. So basically this, this makes me realize that, man, Jesus is the one who took our sins and our penalties. So, so basically Jesus, um, you know, basically turns around our, our sinfulness of humanity, not just your humanity and mine, but even his own genealogy is full of, full of sinners. We'll talk about that further as we get going. So we've, we've looked at da Jesus through the line of David, of the people of Abraham, the Jews. We've seen the four women in the genealogy, which is kind of interesting, but there's, there's, there's something else you should note. And uh, the, uh, the first level reader would kind of miss, there's three people missing um, absentees from this genealogy. Um, and it's in verse eight, in verse eight, where it says, and uh, Joram begat uh, Ozias, or another way of Uzziah. By the way, uh, don't be freaked out by the different pronunciations or spellings of names from the Old Testament to the New. There's a bunch of reasons why that happens. Um, uh, but but there's a, here's a couple. Um, transitions of languages. Remember the, the Hebrew Bible is written in Hebrew. Uh, and, and you transition that to Greek in the New Testament or even Aramaic 
to Greek uh, when we start talking about some of these names. And, and so don't be freaked out. It, it's like, um, um, you know, if you go uh, to different countries, uh, I, I loved it when James and I, Pastor James, you guys all know Pastor James, we went to Africa and, and, uh, and, and we were there and, and they, most of them speak French over there in, in Burkina Faso. And um, I was trying to introduce them, I said, James, and I'm like, J -j 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 I couldn't even say it. Like, J -j -j and and um, one of the guys that knew a little bit of English, he's like, Jacques. <laughs> and, and, and they're like, oh, Jacques, Jacques. Oh, and so they called him Jacques, Jacques the whole time, uh, which I thought was great. That's what happened. Uh, when some of these names are spelled differently, different languages, different translations, but also add several thousand years to the mix. So don't be freaked out when you see different spellings. Like when you, uh, when you see the word Noah in the New Testament and it's spelled N-O-E. Noe? I thought it was Noah. Oh, I can't believe the Bible anymore. And so I've got a misspelling. Don't, don't do that. That's just ridiculous. Okay, just, just thought I'd tell you that. So anyway, the Ozias here in verse eight is Uzziah. But when it says Joram begat Ozias, that's not really true. You say, Brett, that's wrong. That, that didn't happen. Because if you follow the genealogy of the Old Testament in this, there's three people left out between them. Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. Why were they omitted? Um, now, there's some interesting things here because maybe they were just trying to have only 14 generations in this list. 14 divided by two is seven. Um, maybe that, Brett, what are you talking about? Keep that in the back of your mind just for a second. But these three men, why were they taken out? Well, that's where we get to this, this scripture of Deuteronomy 29 that I was getting ready to read to you earlier. Um, you see, these three kings were particularly evil in their worshiping of idolatry. Because of their idol worship, these three guys' names would be blotted out of the history of Israel. In fact, it says here, the Lord, this is the law of Moses. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man and all, his, all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Um, these three kings were particularly wicked in that area of, of that was Deuteronomy 29 was talking about. So their names would be blotted out because of idolatry, as it turns out. Uh, and by the way, those stories are kind of horrible. Ahaziah was slain by Jehu, if you remember, in 2 Kings 9. Joash was slain by his servants, uh, in, internal job, uh, 2 Kings 12. And Amaziah was slain uh, by the people of Jerusalem in 2 Kings 14 because of their idolatry, as it turns out. Now, speaking of that, so you got the, don't, don't be troubled when people say, there's a mistake in the Bible and three names were left out. It's very easily answered by the curses of Deuteronomy 29. Are you guys still with me on that? But there's even a greater problem that if somebody who really knows their Bible, they can throw you for a loop if you're not careful. Um, and by the way, people do this all the time. If you're on, forget the social media, all these guys that cut and paste from atheistrus.com and they've got all the contradictions in the Bible and they like, and they'll just cut and paste all those apparent contradictions. And it's so ridiculous. It's not even worth time. Uh, I wish, I wish, uh, I wish I could go and answer all of those because just because people that are like, oh, wow, that does seem to be a contradiction, even though it's not really an honest look at what's actually happening. Be that as it may, you, you get a lot of that. But this is one that somebody could say, uh, there's a problem, there's a blood curse in the genealogy of Jesus. Does anybody know where the blood curse is? Yes, I heard somebody say it. Uh, take a look at verse 11. Uh, and Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren. Now, if you remember, there was some confusing uh, names back when we were studying the kings. Some of you were here when we were studying kings. Do you guys remember when we met Jeconias? Um, he's got actually three names in the Bible and it gets really confusing. Uh, Jeconias, does anybody remember one of his names? Jehoiachin and also Coniah. Those, those, whenever you see those names, it's the same dude. Jeconiah, Coniah, and Jehoiachin. And there was also a Jehoiakim, different guy. Jehoiakim versus Jehoiachin. So just remember the chin, Coniah, uh, Jeconiah. This is a guy that was cursed um, uh, with a blood curse. And uh, as it turns out, um, the blood curse of Jeconiah is interesting because he was cursed that his descendants would not have, uh, he, his, his descendants would be cursed. 
Um, uh, and, um, and you say, okay, Brett, so uh, what, what, what's the big deal? Well, it would say that none of his descendants would actually be able to be heir, rightful heir to the throne. That's what the Bible says about Jeconiah or Jehoiachin. And you say, well, see, Jesus is a descendant of Jeconiah and the, cur- the curse of the Old Testament. And, and even the Jews would say, yeah, that's why Jesus can't be our Messiah because the blood curse of Jeconiah. His blood was cursed. There can't be any king that comes from Jeconiah. And he's in the list of the genealogy. Here's where the Bible does sort of a fun little end around. Does anybody know how could Jesus be the line of David and be the blessed king of Israel um, if Jeconiah, the blood curse was upon him and his lineage, but he's part of this genealogy. Anybody? Yes. There's another genealogy in Luke chapter three, and it's through the line of Mary. You see, in Matthew chapter one, this is the line through Joseph. In Luke chapter three, it's the line, did you know that Mary links all the way back to King David as well? But you see, the blood of Jeconiah was cursed Did Jesus have Jeconiah's blood running through his veins? No, why not? Virgin birth. Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, You know, you could almost say Joseph was Jesus' stepdad. But you say, what's interesting, then why is this genealogy even here? Well, as it turns out, what's kind of amazing is Jesus is king of the Jews either way, technically through, you know, Joseph or Mary, through both genealogies. But the one, even though it's cursed, um, he's got another path that's not cursed. And there's all kinds of imagery there. Um, you know, you can see the road to David proven by both genealogies of Luke 3, Mary's genealogy, and Matthew 1, Joseph's genealogy. Um, Matthew is through Solomon. Luke's genealogy goes through Nathan, as it turns out. Um, and Luke's, Luke's genealogy doesn't have Jeconiah. Why? Because the blood curse of uh, Jeremiah, um, uh, you can jot this down in your notes, by the way, Jeremiah 22. Um, let me just read to you. We're running out of time, so I'm gonna do this quickly. But Jeremiah 22, verses 24 through uh, 25, it says, as I live, saith the Lord, through Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence, and I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life. And then later on in verses 29 through 30 of, of, um, of Jeremiah 22, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, while ye this man childest, uh, write ye this man childest, as a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall ever prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So this guy, Jeconiah, was cursed that there'd never be another seed of him that would be on the throne in Jerusalem. And fortunately, Jesus doesn't have that curse because he uh, was not part of Jeconiah's line. Are you guys with me on that? That's how the, the, the so-called atheists and people that are on your little chat thing saying, see, Jesus was cursed. And you go, wow, he, Jeconiah was cursed. And, but you gotta, you gotta just kind of see the whole story. Um, and again, it, it reminds us of um, the curse that Jesus literally became for us. He who knew no sin became sin, we're told. Like it all pictures that perfectly, by the way. Uh, but be that as it may. Um, now, as we start to wrap it up, because I need to start wrapping it up, and man, we haven't even got through the genealogy. Um, <laughs> There's some interesting facts about the genealogy. Okay, let, let, let's pretend for a second. Let's say I give you this task. What do you think about this task? I say, I want you to write an important genealogy of your family. And your genealogy of your family, so you go to genealogy.com. I think that's a Mormon thing or something, I don't know. Uh, ancestry.com. But you get all your people and the names and everything. But here's what you need to do. You need to put it in a, in a written form like Matthew chapter one. But there's some rules that I'm gonna make you do when you write this down. Uh, here's what you gotta do. Rule number one, the numbers of words that you can use in the whole presentation uh, have to be divisible by seven. Yeah, you're like, what? Yeah, so your genealogy, you gotta count the words, one, two, three, and and it's gotta be a number divisible by seven from the beginning to the end, like verses one through 16 here in our text. Um, Also, the number of letters that you use in your genealogy have to be divisible by seven. You getting a headache yet? But not only that, the number of vowels and consonants have to be divisible by seven. The number of words beginning with consonants have to be divisible by seven. The number of words used more than once 
are divisible by seven. The number of words that occur in more than one form have to be divisible by seven. The number of words beginning with consonants are divisible by seven, not just consonants and, you know, um, uh, yes. <laughs> um, here, it gets, it, it gets harder. You're, the number of nouns you use have to be divisible by seven. Um, the number of names have to be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns are permitted. And the number of male names divisible by seven. The number of generations that are listed have to be divisible by seven. And I'm just starting on all the things. Everything pretty much in structure and form that you can almost see, um, you can look at it. And shockingly, and you say, what in the world, Brett, what does that have to do with anything? Well, as it turns out, there was this guy who was, a, um, his name was Ivan, Dr. Ivan Panin, who was actually an uh, agnostic, a Russian guy named Ivan. Uh, and he was an agnostic. And Ivan Panin, he was this kind of world famous mathematician. He knew math and he was intrigued, not because he believed the Bible necessarily, but he started seeing stuff as, as, um, uh, as he looked at this genealogy of Jesus, he, he noticed some things. He was like, man, I noticed there's a bunch of things that are uh, in the structures of d divisible by seven. Uh, so in the 1800s, he graduated by the way from Harvard University and he was intrigued by this structural numerical thing in the Bible of sevens. And so in 1890, he discovered um, uh, mathematical structures, both in the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. But perhaps the pinnacle of his study was right here in the genealogy of, of Jesus. And everything that I just told you, all those rules in the Greek language of the Greek New Testament, all of those rules were met. And you think, wait a minute, is that a coincidence? Like, like if you think about it, if you, if you know the odds of that actually just accidentally happening, totally impossible, totally impossible. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, this guy, Dr. Ivan Panin spent his whole life, he wrote over 43,000 handwritten pages of analysis on the sevens in the Bible and the mathematical structures of the Bible. Um, but but um, they, they get, it gets crazier and crazier the more you see what he did. Like for example, do you remember Genesis 38? Uh, the story I was referring to with Tamar and all that um, and the crazy story of Tamar, remember that? It was only a few minutes ago. Yeah, <laughs> you guys were looking like Tamar? <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, um, that story, um, this, is, this, is a, this is an amazing thing. Did you know that if you take that story in the Hebrew text um, and you, um, uh, uh, and, and by the way, um, you know, the, the structure here, I wanna kind of go over this real quickly, but remember, remember the story I told you about uh, in Ruth chapter four, verse 12. Uh, Let thy house be like the house of Pharez, who Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give the of this young woman, Ruth chapter four, um, who, was, who was first born of these twins? There's an interesting thing. There's a red thread throughout the whole Bible. The scarlet thread of Jesus is throughout the whole Bible. So do you remember the twins of Tamar that I told you about? The birth around that was really strange. And I'll just kind of show you that. Genesis 38, verse 28. It came to pass when she travailed, this is Tamar, pregnant by Judah, that one of the babies put his hand out. <laughs> <laughs> and the midwife took a, uh, and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, this one came out first. And it came to pass that he drew his hand back in. Crazy childbirth situation here. <laughs> that behold, his brother came out and she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand. And his name was called Zara. Um, so the, these two babies had this interesting thing with the, one of the sons having the uh, scarlet thread. And this is all part of a, um, the lineage of Jesus. Remember I told you already that it was of a sinful line, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin who knew no sin. This is, this is these, this sinful you know, situation, Tamar and Judah, prostitute, twins. One of the twins has, have this red thread. But um, as, as you keep going through that scarlet thread of the Bible, um, it all points to Jesus. Uh, isn't it funny that the, the red thread on the wrist of the, of the son that's in the lineage of Jesus. But also when you go to Genesis chapter 38, that story, there's an amazing thing about that story that and we just read part of that. 
if you take every 49th, which is a number divisible by seven, if you, t- for those of us that didn't do well in math, um, <laughs> If you take every, if you start with the Hebrew Bible and you read Genesis 38 and you take the first letter and then every 49 letters, it spells the word Boaz. If you keep going, the next word that you spell is you just keep going through that Hebrew Bible is the word Ruth. If you keep going from there, the next word is Obed, if you know, which is the father of Jesse. And it, can you guess what the next word is if you keep going? Jesse, and then if you keep going after that, the word is David. This is in Genesis 38, before Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and David even ever existed. It's in the book of of, uh, Genesis chapter 38. I'm just telling you stuff, what do you do with that? Do we make ourselves the mathematic church of Jesus Christ? (laughs) Um, No, Uh, (laughs) wear tinfoil hats and all that stuff, no. Um, Why does the Bible do stuff like that? I don't have the foggiest idea <laughs> other, other than this. And this is why Dr. Ivan Panin, he's famous because he spent you know, his whole life finding these weird little structures of sevens in the Bible. But um, I'll tell you what I think of it. Uh, I don't make a religion out of that. I don't, I don't think we should make a huge deal of it. Other than this, when you read your Bible, this is something that even if you use supercomputers today, quantum computers and stuff today. You couldn't write a story and a book with accurate genealogies and all the truth historically, but also have the structures that are behind it. That's called impossible. In other words, it's the fingerprint of God on this book that you kind of just have to say, wow, that's amazing. Now, what do you do? Uh, if, If you find a skeptic that's willing to try to do debate on this, um, It's kind of funny because you'll hear a few people try and they'll say, well, the Jews sort of rearranged it later uh, to sort of fit that, to make that sort of happen. But if you you think about it for 10 seconds, to take a true story that actually happened and rearrange it to make it work, even that's kind of a miracle. Like you you still have to give, like those Jews, nobody, even even to have a supercomputer today, you couldn't really figure out how to make everything like it is in multiples of seven. I think you see in Genesis 38, Matthew chapter one, and all over the Bible, you see that scarlet thread of God's fingerprints all over the Bible. And I think that's what makes these genealogies kind of come alive. Um, I bet you when we get to heaven, we're gonna be blown away about what the Bible actually did and showed us without us even knowing it. I think there's a lot that we don't know, which makes the Bible really fun uh, to study. But anyway, all that to say, uh, you say, okay, Brett, what do we do with that? Be excited about the Bible. We know this is the word of God. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And even the genealogies, uh, which we only got through tonight, um, are rich in meaning. So there you have it. Um, What did we learn tonight? Jesus is king of the Jews, Messiah of the Jews. We learned that even though his bloodline was cursed, the Lord covered it through the lineage of Mary, who is, he was bloodline through Mary. We learned that um, the plan of God perfectly unfolded in so many ways, but one of those ways, even these numbers that work out, it's kind of like the fingerprint of God. That's pretty cool stuff, if you ask me. Well, Lord, we do pray that you just give us uh, understanding as we go through the gospel of Matthew. Lord, there's so much here. And um, Lord, we just wanna see your son, Jesus. We wanna learn more and draw close to him, Lord. I pray you'd bless this time as we do it. Bless these, your people, as we go our way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.